Welcome to uh, day one of, of NeuroFutures, and I um, also want to thank the people that, that came for the um, public lecture last night with uh, Gary Marcus. Um, it was really a, a special thing. I think we've had maybe an estimate about 150 people, and, and um, wide range, a lot of young computer scientists that were interested in AI. Um, so um, it, it's a real pleasure to uh, kick off our, our first talk at um, NeuroFutures with um, Laura Luger from Danelia Farm. Um, but I'd first like to thank um, the, the people on the organizing committee. And um, we don't have a slide up, um, but um, it, as you saw as you came in, uh, we have several major sponsors. We have Leica Microsystems. And um, NeuroFutures is um, a unique conference. It's a, it's a partnership uh, between uh, University of Washington, the Allen Institute for, for Brain Science, and Oregon Health and Science University, um, as well as, uh, more recently, um, UBC. So we're, we're really trying to develop neuroscience in the, um, in the Cascadia uh, corridor and uh, we, we hope that this is the start of many courses and exchanges and things that we can do um, along uh, I-5 and uh, Route 99 into Canada. Um, so uh, the other thing I'd, I'd like to do is to mention uh, people that have assisted with this um, on, on our uh, steering committee. So uh, Anne-Marie Craig from uh, UBC really, really helped me a lot with the science um, and selecting speakers and also getting the brain clearing workshop uh, scheduled, which is on Wednesday. Um, and uh, Sherry Musimori um, from University of Washington was also instrumental. Uh, Terry Gilbert and Amy Bernard from the Allen Institute for getting um, a number of, of really uh, top young uh, scientists from the Allen Institute to tell us about new directions and technologies. Uh, Rad Roberts from University of Washington. Um, Bill Rooney uh, from uh, Oregon Health and Science University. And then uh, Jane Roskins uh, from uh, UBC, who will be here um, uh, towards the end of the conference. And I don't want to take up any more of Lauren's time. But, uh, Lauren, um, as many of you know, uh, is, is from Janelia Farms and um, uh, involved in leading the, um, the Genie Project, the um, initiative to make uh, better indicators, protein indicators of uh, neuronal activity. And this has been, really been um, a remarkable uh, evolution of, of these probes. And um, I, I've also been really impressed by um, how Lauren's done this uh, and Janelia really making these probes available in, in many cases uh, before the papers even come out to really in, ensure that there's uptake by the community and, um, and, and feedback and, and how, to, how to make the reagents better. So um, I, I think he's got, a, he's got a whole hour of, of different um, uh, sensors to, to tell us about and a lot of exciting directions we might know him, I guess, best recently for, for GCAP, but we'll, we'll hear about glutamate, GABA, uh, glucose, uh, some other um, neurotransmitters and, and metabolites as well. So, uh, Laura Luger from Genelia Farm. Well, thank you, Tim, and the rest of the organization committee for having me. Uh, it's a real treat to be up, be up here. Um, I'm going to talk about sensors and other things. Um, I usually give my talks as a choose your own format, uh, choose your own adventure, where you guys, I show up the topics and you guys get to pick. But I was looking at the agenda while I was writing my talk, and I, I'm not playing it. And so I thought I would just steal the organizer's great pipeline that they came up with in the order in which I'll talk about things. Um, so we'll talk about sensor, 
answers first, like Tim said. Um, you know, uh, Jeannie probably best. Uh, Jeannie in our lab for making the uh, GCAMP 6 indicators and um, building on a scaffold that our lab made, our camp, and a scaffold that Robert's lab made, our gecko, <laughs> um, and 2.0-ifying those into JR camp and JR gecko 1. Um, I want to show you uh, a couple recent applications of the existing tools and then uh, start to walk you through, uh, you know, this is a uh, constantly evolving process. So there will be, you know, no tool is perfect. And so it's, you know, always, you know, when is it good enough to get to some people to do some things. And so there are a lot of um, 3.0 versions of uh, everything on the way. And I'm sure uh, Robert will probably touch on that as well. And so we should probably coordinate to make sure we're not doing the same thing. Um, this paper uh, just came out. Uh, so when you have a green uh, family of green indicators and a family of red indicators, you know one of the most obvious things to do is to do two color. This is not uh, entirely novel. There, there's been a couple papers doing two color imaging, uh, but what uh, Vivek and Yi did that was so special is they really did a tour de force. Uh, application optimizing these things for simultaneous two photon imaging in the uh, Drosophila brain. So if you do a two photon spectra on a green indicator and a red indicator, you can see it's a little messy. Uh, there's going to be uh, so a, a lot of uh, things will excite both of them at the same time. On the emission side, it's a bit cleaner. Um, but you know, we frequently work, you know, you hear a lot about the reds polluting the greens channel. The, um, the, the green will pollute the red channel too. And so this is one thing that's been uh, underappreciated and something they really optimized. So uh, if you excite at uh, this was the out of the box conditions for how to use GCAMP and Argecto when they started. You're doing uh, two photons at a thousand and you're pretty strict with the green you're collecting and you're not so strict with the red you're collecting. Um, and what this gives you is mass and so the, this fly is just expressing GCAMP. It's not expressing Argecto. And so what you see is that the green channel is massively polluting the red channel, and there's actually a, a linear uh, correlation, and it's messy. So if you optimize two things, so if you instead uh, excite a bit redder at 1020 and are a bit more stringent on your Argecto, then the correlation goes away, and now you have pretty silent uh, red. So, you know, uh, this paper uh, just came out. You can dive through the supplementary materials and see every combination they tried and see if these uh, parameters, you know, and to cut a long story short, they managed to do simultaneous green and red and worked out a pretty beautiful circuit for uh, visual processing in the, in the fly brain. Um, other things that are um, uh, recently coming out with the, the tools as they currently exist, uh, this is not that recent. This is three years ago. Uh, we published Thai one lines for the GCAMP 6S and 6F. Uh, these are getting a moderate bit of, um, of uptake. We started with like 50 founders and, you know, this is brutal amount of work. We grind through them and uh, we ended up with five that we liked that we sent to Jax and people are starting to use these and some really cool papers are coming out. The reason I have this up here now is that we've recently done the same thing with uh, JR Gecko 1A. They're looking really good. Um, Maybe, uh, hopefully by the end of the year, these thigh one lines will be available. And um, so the second killer app about having a red sensor is that um, really gets rid of a lot of the, the autofluorescence and you can go deeper. So I think that these mics will be really useful for like 
pan cortical uh, imaging, uh, perhaps even a bit deeper, uh, lower background. Um, we are aware of the recent report from uh, Alan and um, a lot of other people that um, if you drive the heck out of uh, G-Camp 6, you can run into problems. <laughs> um, you know, with this epileptiform uh, spiking here. Um, I, I, you know, I, we haven't been working with these lines. Uh, we haven't needed to drive uh, it this strongly because, you know, so the way the system works in the tiger locus is that you have a Cree dependence, but then you have to have a tet trans transactivator amplification of the, sig of the, the expression levels. And so you build up pretty high concentrations of protein, um, which can, you know, can be good for imaging. You know, more probe is more photons, but um, as you can see, it can be disastrous for cell health. Um, as the authors themselves note, this has only been seen in the uh, particular combination with the emx one pre if you dial down to uh, things that express a little weaker, uh, you're fine. Um, and just as a tiny, tiny footnote, um, a lot of people think that the, the cytotoxicity mode of the Gekis is from calcium buffering. It, that may be a player, but I think it's a pretty small player. I think what's actually happening is that we're messing up calmodulin signaling. And we have a lot of circumstantial evidence that it's, that it's not the fact that you're binding up the calcium and, and tickling the transients, but the calmodulin is running around doing naughty things. And so on our um, huge to-do list is to make um, uh, gekis that are a bit more bioorthogonal, so that aren't recognizing as many of the uh, endogenous targets, uh, but that's harder than it sounds. Um, so what's on deck? Uh, there are going to be, um, of course, you know, GCAMP 7 variants coming. Uh, the first one that we hope to be able to deliver by the end of summer will be a, you know, GCAMP 6F plus, maybe, um, that will have 6F like speed, but much better dynamic range. So if, if you've been using 6S because of its kinetics, but the SNR hasn't been quite there, this is the reagent for you. Um, and that's driven by Genie. Um, and uh, two separate efforts in Genie and in my lab, uh, we're trying to make 6F even faster, so a 6FF. -F. Um, and we, uh, thus far in, in vitro preps, we've managed to get it six-fold faster than 6F, which I think is about as fast as you can make it before you start running up against the underlying calcium transient. And uh, now we're just, you know, we broke SNR a bit by making it so fast, and now we have to build that back up. So I hope to be able to get those in your hands by winter. Um, uh, you know, there have been uh, some um, negative indicators in the past. The first one was uh, inverse pericam. Uh, Robert Waigeto is another example. Um, none of these have been super robust in the applications where you might want a negative GCAMP, for instance, to look at inhibitory inputs onto spines because, you know, chloride indicators are really pretty bad and voltage indicators are hit or miss and at, you know, at best very application specific. So. Uh, we think that um, this will be a good way to monitor, monitor um, inhibitory inputs. And as you'll see later with the sniffers, uh, we're also trying to tackle this at the, um, the, the input side by actually looking at inhibitory neurotransmitters. Um, and like I mentioned, uh, the reds now are getting 3.0-ified, um, you know, better SNR, um, uh, faster kinetics. Uh, the photophysics of um, our gecko and our camp are, in our hands, pretty hard to modulate. 
Um, and so, you know, our camp bleaches and our gecko switches, although, you know, that, that can be less of a problem if you, if you control for it. Um, but one way we're tackling that is building um, a new uh, red gecko scaffold based on M Scarward. And this is very preliminary, but it looks like it will have better uh, photophysics. So less, less polluting of the green, uh, less switching, and maybe less bleaching. Um, okay, just want to go ahead and say that's the genie team. It's a um, behemoth. And we are very privileged to have all these people uh, pulling as one. Um, our next one is Dive. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, let me know if this goes too fast. I'll send you my slides and we can chat in the break and whatever. So don't, don't worry if, if I go too fast. Um, the other kind of uh, indicators we make are the so-called sniffers. Um, not so that's S N F R. That's not to be confused with sniffer C N I F R, which are the hex cell based neurotransmitter and neuro and neuromodulator uh, sensors uh, um, um, that are out there. But you know, it, it, those have their purposes and they're pretty easy to make. So, you know, they, they recently had one for um, neuropeptides. It's going to be hard for us to make, we've tried it, it's going to be hard for us to make a strictly protein-based neuropeptide indicator. And so I think there are some killer apps for the cellular sniffers in, in just protein space that we can't access. But if you think about it, injecting a huge hex cell tumor into your brain probably not how you want to start your experiment if you can all, at all avoid it. And you know, for obvious reasons, you can't really access the synaptic cleft or whatever. So we occupy this space where we're trying to make uh, strictly protein-encoded indicators of neurotransmitters, neuromodulators, um, signaling factors, etc. cetera. Uh, this is iGlue Snipper, the, uh, the one that's the best developed, this is published a while back, so this is just a placeholder there. Um, so you get these really nice uh, spikes uh, during uh, active bouts. Um, the the uh, signals are localized to uh, uh, spine heads in this case. Um, if you knock out TCX, the signal goes away. And if you add uh, agents known to increase uh, extracellular glutamate, you boost your signal. Pretty conclusive evidence. And we also, we think, you know, one thing I think the sensor community needs to do better is that in, um, every sensor, I think, needs to have an internal negative control that you can use side by side. So what we have now is for glue sniffer, we have now have a glue sniffer that, where the binding pocket has been ablated. And so it doesn't bind glutamate, but is in every other respect entirely the same. I think it's traffic. And um, so if you put non-binding glutamate sniffers on there, there's no signal. So it's not pH artifacts or some sort of photo switching or some just bizarre process that's not what you think it is. And so I think we all need to uh, step up and start doing this. Um, we have, uh, um, as I mentioned, uh, 2.0 variants of the iGlue sniffer uh, that come in a couple different flavors. Uh, we've, um, by uh, incorporating a lot, but not all, of the superfolder mutations into the GFP and re optimizing the linkers and doing a couple other esoteric things. We've managed to make uh, a glue sniffer that has much better uh, membrane targeting. And uh, so you seem to get um, less of that annoying inactive intracellular pool that just gives you the background. Um, and it just seems brighter at the, at the cell membrane. So we find that this is really working uh, well and that this should probably become the new default eye glue sniffer is the super iglucephora, as we call it. Um, and in some preps, but not all, 
uh, having that uh, better expression level out there and better targeting gives you more photo stability, so you can image harder and longer. Um, we've also managed to uh, yellow shift it to get the peak exactly at 1030 nanometers. Um, this is in collaboration with Local Boy, uh, Kasper Grigorski, who's doing great at Genelia. You guys, your UVC people in the audience will be proud to know. Um, he has, it, I probably don't have time to tell you about his thing, and you probably may have heard about it. He needs things exactly at 1030 because of the new fiber lasers that are right there that have enormous bits of power that you can divide into all these smaller packets and send out to do really fast volumetric imaging. Um, uh, and the existing ones were um, uh, pretty bad. And so uh, we're uh, having pretty good luck moving GCAMP to work at 1032, uh, because again, the YCAMP one that we made in our paper and uh, YGECO from Robert haven't performed robustly in this, and so it needed a YCAMP two or three. And um, I'm sure Robert is uh, hope maybe going to mention this, but um, extending the red from the geckies to the sniffers has been brutally hard. And we've been working on it for five years because obviously, if you have like a GABA and a glutamate and a dopamine sniffer, what you really want to do is multicolor and see where they all are at the same time. But this has been ludicrously different and uh, difficult, and hopefully, Robert can uh, give us all some advice. <coughs> yeah. Uh, so the yeah. yellow shifting will basically keep that entire cycle thing out for copy indicators or anything other indicators. Oh, yeah. So this is not going to be useful for two color. That it's just too close to the green and it's too close to the red. Don't consider this as a tool for two color. Consider this as a niche tool that hopefully won't be that niche once Casper's cheap and robust fast volumetric imaging uh, paper gets published and it's taken up by the entire field and you don't have to buy expensive high sapphires anymore. So that's the way you should think about the yellow indicators right now. Um, we also made uh, affinity and kinetics variants of the glue snippers because we just we published a, a one with a KD of about four micromolar, which is right at affinity of AMPA and MBA receptors, and it seemed pretty ideally uh, tuned. It has, it's been suboptimal though, and a lot of people, so this is um, ferret visual cortex from the Fitzpatrick lab. They tried glue sniffer 1.0, and they just got a bunch of flat lines, and they're like, man, you know, it's not really that good. Um, so we sent them the 4X tighter version, and now they suddenly say, hey, this is pretty awesome. So for whatever reason, the synapses in the ferret visual cortex seem to have lower glutamate concentrations than the rest of the places we've been looking at. And by giving you 4x tighter affinity, now you're in the dynamic range of these things and you can get uh, robust signals. Um, uh, we also made it much weaker. Um, the most obvious thing to do with this is to uh, image in areas of incredibly high glutamate concentration, like cerebellar granule cells. Um, um, another thing is that with now four uh, variants over um, like two and a half logs, you can actually uh, start to dial in on estimates. I'm not going to call them actual concentrations, but estimates of actual concentrations when you actually have three single site binding isotherms that cover that much. Um, uh, we've uh, recently started to diversify away from glutamate. Uh, the one, not necessarily the first one we started, but the one that's working the best and I think is, so everything is completely available to you guys. And so at the end and in the coffee break, we should talk about how you should get all these things. Um, so uh, acetylcholine, I think, is ready to go. It's um, at least at Glucifer 1.0 levels of performance and maybe at 2.0 uh, 
level of performance. So uh, this is the work of Phil. After five years of optimizing these things, uh, he now has a pretty huge Dell F, a pretty appropriate KD for acetylcholine, and uh, this is like the N minus one or N minus two version. He now actually has a greater therapeutic window over choline. Um, um, and so uh, this is Joe from Wimpy Out Gans Lab at NYU, exactly the same prep as uh, I showed you for Glue Sniffer. And you get Glue Sniffer like responses when the mouse is running on the treadmill. Um, uh, you know, when it's running, you get these, uh, these little blips. Um, if you add GTX, the blips uh, drop a lot. They don't go completely to zero. We think we're understanding why this is. Um, and if you add a uh, uh, cholinesterase inhibitor that stretches out your acetylcholine transient, the signal goes up. M1 or five pyramidal cells. Um, and he's also he's also done that there's so much material I don't have time to cover it, but he's done a lot where um, instead of behaviorally driven transients, he's uh, draw driving strong cholinergic input by um, injecting electric current into the nucleus of the salus and just raining acetylcholine down on these dendrites, and you get preposterous signals. And um, we've done, you know, now we have the, the acetylcholine non-binding control sensor, and that shows nothing. So this really is acetylcholine. And, um, you know, I, I, one thing I should point out is it's, you know, when you have a scale bar, it's 10 seconds on these things, you can say that they're, they, they look like little blips, but you can't say how fast these things are. These things are really, really fast. So one good thing about the sniffers is that they are essentially running at diffusion limit. So K on for these things is between 10 to the eighth and 10 to the ninth per molar per second. And off rates are, you know, 5,000 to 10,000 per second. And so we actually have a kinetic model of all these things. And the bottom line is you are really not tickling these transients that are coming across the synaptic cleft, even for single vesicle release events. So when you have minis coming across with about 500 molecules of glutamate, the EPSPs and EPSCs are completely identical and uh, you get these little quantum blips of, of signal from single vesicles uh, coming across. So I really don't think, I think it's a legitimate concern to worry about Gecky's buffering calcium. For right now, for the high-performing sniffers, I, I think it's absolutely of no concern that they're tickling the transient. And maybe, you know, because you would say, oh, maybe the 500 glues in that single vesicle, maybe they're being delayed and only 300 of, of them actually get to the receptors and it's a little laid and the, and the synapse is confused. That doesn't really seem to be the case. These things are wickedly fast. So much so that, that um, uh, most of the imaging in our lab and other labs of these things uh, you really need to run at 100 hertz, preferably about 250 hertz to to um, to get ideal responses. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, what what would you say the occupancy is like if you did have a, a mini? So, how many proteins have to bind glutamate before you see a signal? Do you have any? Like, we've tried to we've tried to model this. That that's the hard part is figuring out how many sniffer molecules are actually out there and if their biophysical properties are different than um, you know the way we've been able to characterize them in vitro that that you know i'm going to make up a molly a, a number and say that i think there are between 500 and a thousand sniffer molecules on a on a spine head 
Um, I, I don't know how many of them are emitting photons to give you the, the blip that you see. Um, to be continued, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hopefully we'll be able to get all the parameters we need for a, a really good kinetic model of um, what's going on at the synapse. Um, and then uh, I just downloaded this morning. Uh, this is uh, Jerry, Jeremy Dittman at Cornell. I don't understand the slide uh, completely, um, but he's very happy. And uh, since he's clearly getting uh, cold energy responses at synapses in the worm egg laying circuit. And we have um, uh, preliminary data from um, Drosophila, Drosophila antenna lobe, but that's with now like the N minus four version. And we saw signals, but they were really, really pretty weak. Um, but um, I think we also have fish in vivo now that looks pretty convincing, but didn't make this talk. Um, uh, as Tim mentioned, uh, GABA is also a really high priority target, you know, particularly with chloride and voltage being iffy at best. And if you want to look at inhibition, I think, you, I think the, the best way in the short run is to actually go before it reaches it, so catch, catch it on the way in. Um, so GABA, this has been our hardest one. Uh, we've been working on this for five years, and I think we're only now getting to like a G Camp 3, maybe even just two and a half level sensor. So this is this is not ready to make a mouse yet. We're, people are getting decent results with virus, and so we're more than happy to send uh, you guys virus. Just really don't bet the farm on this one yet. Although I would on the acetylcholine one. That, that one's been pretty robust in almost everyone's hands. Um, we, you know, so five years later, we've got the affinity in about the right range. We actually, um, I think it needs to be about an order of magnitude tighter. Um, but it's got good specificity, brilliant display, and um, in vitro, huge fluorescent changes, you know, like 20 fold. Um, but when you put it on the membrane, um, everything seems to, to, to get degraded. We're trying to debug um, what this is. You know, now you have to start worrying about, you know, real details like, like constellation sites and things that could be messing up your sensor. Uh, once it got to the place it needs to be. Um, but we think at this point at this point we're confident to say that a real reason that we're having trouble is I think GABA concentrations are actually pretty low. I think they're actually lower than people have estimated from microdialysis. And so I think we've been up against the wall in a couple different ways on the protein side, but also just the underlying transients I think are pretty unforgiving. Um, but uh, you can get it to work uh, in vivo. Uh, this is obviously a zebrafish. Um, and uh, what they're doing is they have this fictive uh, swimming prep. And uh, you're measuring these little uh, GABA transients. You can see they pretty much overlap one to one with bouts of fictive swimming. You can see, I mean, these are pretty wimpy signals, though. We're now we're talking like 1 to 4% del F over F. Uh, this is, I think this is an N minus 2 version. So uh, this will get better. But when uh, they did a correlation analysis to figure out where the, the swimming lock signals are occurring, it seems to be in, um, Purkinje cells, which is where they would have predicted that they would be. So we're cautiously optimistic that GABA is on its way to working. Um, this is a glucose sensor. Um, uh, as Tim mentioned, I, I want to show you something totally different, which is probably less relevant to this audience, but pretty cool. 
is that if you have sensors, you know, so I've been showing you extracellular versions of the sensors. If you stick them on the, in the cytoplasm, there's actually other really cool things you can do. And one thing is to set up a high throughput assay for transporters. So what we do is we drive the glucose sensor inside the cell, we overexpress various uh, transporters of that analyte, and we run this carefully optimized uh, program of analyte coming in and out and making sure everything else like osmolarity is, is preserved, and you get pretty robust oscillations of the, the sensor, and you can do things like toss on inhibitors, and um, you get so many in, so many in of trials from a single cell, and then you get so many cells in the dish, that within about a 15 minute experiment, you get enough data to confidently pull out um, the rate constants of your transporters, KI, all these things, and so, um, uh, if any of you in the audience are at all interested in profiling transporters, and your transporters happen to transport one of the things that we have, um, I can give you the complete list of things that we have. It's probably like 15 or 16 now. Then just ask me, and we can hook you up with the transporter and um, everything you need to set this up, which will cost you like $5,000. It's really cheap. This is glucose. But we also have an ATP sensor, which you can see on this next slide. ATP, uh, that's the guy that did the glucose. Uh, ATP has been uh, in collaboration with Val Koch at UCLA um, in something completely unrelated. Uh, with Henry Lester, we managed to design a nicotine sensor um, that actually works pretty darn good. Um, uh, and so we're now diversifying uh, the same scaffold that gave rise to the nicotine sensor. Uh, we've been able to diversify it to a number of other cholinergic and serotonergic drugs. Um, so if you're interested in how drugs are um, taken up and moved around and what neurons they go to and what sort of activity you get with that, um, Ask us because we have. That's um. Oh, this works well. Um, both we have extra and intra version. Uh, yes, wildly. Yeah, like four logs. Yeah, but we've got that. We've got you know. Same one doesn't work. No. No, that'd be a disaster. No, we have, yeah, if you want intra or extra, we'll get you the right affinity version. And we have um, uh, red reference FP fused versions if you want a better control for motion, uh, that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, just, just ask me afterwards about that. Um, uh, okay, so again, uh, trying to get back to the lines as much as possible because I know this is, you know, in the end, one of the most useful things for you guys is when you have a, tr a reliable transgenic that lets you do all these things. Um, early on, we made a Phi-1 of iGlue Stemper 1. It was too dim in our hands when we actually just terminated the line. Uh, we probably should have sent it to you guys to see if you could get anything out of it, but we thought, we thought it wasn't really worth characterizing. Um, Alan stepped in, uh, thankfully, and made uh, two pre-dependent blue stepper lines. Uh, the Cree alone one seemed uh, too weak in their hands, and so he leaves the Tiger amplification trick, and this, is, this has been a robust line. Uh, lots of people getting a lot of mileage out of it, and coincidentally, or, or not, a lot of them at UBC. So this is, yeah, it's great to, to have a, uh, a place that's so excited about Blue Stemper. So I think um, uh, we, or uh, I know Alan is trying to get out of the business of, of making so many pre-lines for everybody, so we may have to step up and do it ourselves. 
Um, I think we should try again with blue 2.0. Maybe even the 5.1 would be bright enough with that one. The at, uh, acetylcholine is ready to go, and GABA, mm, maybe, maybe by the end of the year, I think we'll have one so we can start making lines. And we do have the um, ATP line, but that's uh, really recently derived and poorly characterized, but it looks pretty good. Um, okay, so now switching gears. Um, uh, in, in an upcoming talk, you've got um, uh, someone from um, the protein design lab or whatever it, at UW um, working on the Baker Lab uh, technology. Um, I want to give, give you guys a glimpse that, you know, so um, he wrote his abstract to say useful for future neuroscience applications. I want to show you that the stuff they're making is actually already useful for current neuroscience applications. So hopefully I'll get you excited for the upcoming talk. The one we focused on is the um, the nanocages that they've recently published, um, where, I mean, and this is just amazing that this, this works. You, you uh, decide um, what sort of Euclidean solid you want to make, <coughs> and then just easy as pie, you line it up using computational design, and then they invariably work. Um, and so, uh, uh, or not. <laughs> I mean, it's all hard, but it's amazing that it's gotten this far. So there's a uh, tetrahedral two-component system, an icosahedral two-component system, and there's a one-component system that I'm going to show you data from, but I can't find in my notes which one it is. I don't think it's the I'm the octahedral one, but I, I got a bit confused in my notes, and um, hopefully uh, the upcoming speaker can clarify. Um, these things, um, so, you know, they saw the crystal structures and show the design looks exactly as expected. This is negative stain TEM, and when you do particle alignment, you can see that they actually look beautiful and are the right size. I uh, believe this is the tetrahedron, this is the, the octahedron. Um, we ask ourselves, well, how can we put these things to use for neuroscience? And so uh, we had a couple dreams. Um, you know, there are all sorts of FPs for fluorescent labeling of cells. There are very few useful EM markers for cells. I mean, the, you know, there's HRP and Minisog and Apex, you know, but that requires all sorts of additional steps. I mean, it'd be great to have something that just worked and gave you a shape in EEM where you could say, hey, I've labeled that cell with the tetrahedrons and this cell with the icosahedrons. And in the EEM, you can clearly see like this dendritic process has a bunch of tetrahedrons in it, and so it must be that cell. Um, uh, so that was the first dream. Uh, a backup dream was to take the um, to take the cages and jam them full of fluorescent proteins uh, that Jacob Bale had already done, and to use these as traceable little FP signatures in cells that you could use for tracing instead of just filling the cell and then having kind of a mess. Uh, you wanted to have some sort of visually inspectable uh, pattern. And then a long shot was that, hey, maybe if you build a cage around your payload, whatever it is, maybe it armors it and makes it resistant to fixation or proteolytic degradation or something like that. And so you could have um, you know, some sort of uh, escort of payload around the cell. Um, the one thing that's gone uh, beautifully is using them to uh, package FPs. This is the one component system that I think is not the, the octahedron, but I can't remember which one it is. This has SF superfolder GFP packed inside. This is expressed in a hex cell. And so you look at it uh, just in wide field and you're like, huh. 
well, that, that's starting to look pretty good. Maybe those are our, um, you know, little cages. Then you zoom in, and under confocal, it's even more optimistic. And then if you switch from confocal to stead, uh, now it looks like we have, you know, quantum cages filled with GFP. And I don't have the scale bar on there, but um, it lines up exactly with what they look like from the crystal structures and the negative stain to EM. So I'm pretty confident at this point that we can say that you can express these things in um, mammalian tissue and they actually can work to shepherd, shepherd FPs around and to make them into uh, patterns of, of dots that you could maybe use for, um, to help with conectomic efforts. Particularly, if we could get this to also have a beautiful EM signal. Um, unfortunately, that's been difficult. Uh, the current cages are too small. They're like 20 nanometers across. And if you do high resolution on tissues, you realize that there's a lot of other stuff that's about 20 nanometers across and looks like cages. And so at this point, we're struggling to figure out, um, you know, we've had the world experts look at our EM and they're like, yeah, we really can't tell where they are. So this is on hold. Um, using them to payload FPs around is working great. The, um, well, I showed you the results from the one component cage. The two component cages are okay. I think the cages themselves are fine. And again, it, you know, to get you excited for Robert's talk, the failure seems to be those blasted red FPs that, that are not really monomeric. They love the clump. They end up in the endosome, you know. So right now, I think we can blame the failure of the two component cages on old M cherry, which causes a lot of problems. And so we're migrating back to M crimson to see if that improves things. And the notion that these might serve as some sort of arbor for FPs or inside, inside, uh, inside didn't really work. And I saw two other words in uh, the design talk, switches and channels. Uh, I have no idea what you're talking about, but we have switches and channels too. And so maybe in the coffee break, let's chat about, um, about what we have and how we can maybe work together. Uh, we also have tools for meso connectivity. Uh, one of these things, uh, and after this is published a few years back, I'll just uh, blast through this. We wanted to make super antigens. I know that's a reserved immunological term. Maybe I'll call them hyper antigens. Um, just something that had a, uh, so uh, we wanted, if you just take like flag tag and you put like 20 repeats in a row, this ends up being pretty bad. The cell doesn't like it and degrades it, and the antibodies can't all bind simultaneously, and so these linear epitope repeats end up being pretty miserable. So what we decided is to take a rock hard scaffold like Superfolder GFP, computationally design in the epitope repeats into the loops, and um, we actually have evidence that when we put like 18 flag tags here, astonishingly, it binds 18 IgGs simultaneously. So it worked exactly as expected. Uh, so uh, you get these hyperantigens. They come in a couple different flavors. You can have multiple FP scaffolds. Well, we have like six different flavors of epitopes now. And you can either turn the chromophore off to preserve all your spectral bandwidth for things like Alexas that you're going to bring in on the antibodies, or for some niche applications, you want to keep the chromophore bright. For instance, if you're going to use them in immuno EM, you still need to find the tissue to dissect out. And without a fluorescent label, that's brutally difficult, and you always miss it. So you want to have the green on so you can do your surgery and then come in with your antibodies on top. So 
and we have all these different flavors. We can get all these to you. Um, they work really robustly. Uh, this is GFP in the hippocampus. Uh, for comparison, this is a spaghetti monster flag. These are exactly the same uh, settings on the confocal. And you can see that um, uh, you start to see, these are the thorny excrescences that um, Cajal loved. And uh, this is the first genetically encoded visualization of a uh, fluorescent visualization of the thorny excrescence. So again, to show you uh, GFP, you don't see them. Spaghetti monster, you do. Uh, the only other existing way uh, uh, the state of the art has been to use Lucifer Yellow with antibody amplification. And you can see that um, you know, you're, you're pretty much in line with Cajal's original Golgi stain. So those are, these are really good epitopes uh, to use for immunohistochemical labeling. Uh, you can also uh, do single molecule imaging. Uh, in uh, living cells, as an aside. Um, where we're taking this now is uh, in a rainbow uh, direction. This is uh, Indrosophila, and this is Jerry Rubin's multicolored flip out. Um, and I just, I could look at these images all day long. So you're doing stochastic recombination. This is now, I think this is just three different colors of spaghetti with immunohistochemical uh, amplification. Um, but you, uh, that's with the pure labels here where you start to get the mixes. And uh, you can uh, get many, many uh, separable colors. You can do single neuron reconstruction. Um, and yet another collaboration with the Allen Institute. You're going to hear a lot of these in my talk is that um, uh, we're optimizing a Brainbow 2.0 system. Um, and I know one person we work with is Forrest Coleman. And I think the other person we work with is Forrest, but I couldn't, but not Coleman. And I couldn't find him on the website. So we'll check. There's no other Forrest. OK. All right. Well, maybe we can figure out um, um, who this is that we're actually working with. And this is in, um, what's super cool is this is actually in human tissue. Um, so this has been a really fun uh, collaboration, and I can't wait to see where it goes. Um, I don't have much time left. Let me uh, try to get to some other fun bits. Multi-lab uh, collaboration uh, that we did. Um, to generate retrograde tracing AA reads. Um, so uh, this, oh, I, I seem to have lost the intro uh, here. What we're doing is we're, um, we're injecting uh, into the ponds, and the uh, ponds receives over 95% of its inputs from layer five uh, cortical cells. And so you think if you had uh, a decent retrograde label that you injected it here, and you get more than six cells in layer five. So you know, e even though despite to the contrary, uh, AAV2 is safe to say not strongly retrograde in the mouse. So what we did, uh, in that big collaboration is we designed uh, um, serotype mutants. So we did inserts into uh, various parts of the capsid, trying to recruit maybe, you know, simultaneously ablate some interactions of the serotype and create others. And then after five selection rounds of injecting one place and dissecting out tissue from places far away where the projection should have been coming from, so it can't be contaminated by this local spread. Um, amazingly, the sequencing converged precisely on one uh, motif 
in the, um, in the insert. And so now uh, we took this guy, and now you inject in the ponds, and you label about 95% of cortical layer 5 neurons. So I'm going to call that pretty damn good. Um, and uh, also, you pick up all these other places that projected to the ponds that were invisible uh, with the, um, the previous tracer. And now to quantitate it, you know, there are like high profile nature papers saying that each of these three serotypes is retrograde. Some of them are even supposedly synapse jumping. Um, I, I'm just going to go ahead and say that they're not. Um, and so, you know, the quote unquote state of the art for retrograde transport has been canine identifiers, CAV2. Uh, in addition to being brutally difficult to produce, it's only made by a single lab in the world. It's pretty cytotoxic. It's just not that retrograde transporting. And so uh, DJ does a bit better. Um, RAV retro blows the socks off everybody. Um, even the state of the art, state of the art small molecule tracer floral. So we think now it's safe to say that we are getting almost all projections retrogradely labeled. And you can start to do, so I told you about those spaghetti monster epitopes. So you can start to do pretty cool mesoscale connectivity. So these are now, these are all AAV retro serotypes. And the three payloads are three different spaghetti monsters. So you get the best immune to chemistry, and as you can see, we've done uh, injections in the thalamus pond and superior colliculus. Uh, you get these beautiful images. And now we've got this huge matrix of injection sites. They're starting to include um, the uh, spinal cord, you know, pretty, pretty much just at, um, uh, everywhere involved in the pyramidal tract. And I think we're pretty close coming up with a, a, a full wiring diagram of, of uh, PT neurons. Um, I wanted to leave some time for questions, so I might triage a bit, a bit of this. Um, I'll just go uh, fast through. Uh, what? Who? Quick question yeah. on the AAV spectrum. Yeah. Um, so in the paper, you guys talked about potentially altering network binding Yep. It's, it's we, we think it's more complicated than that. We have, we have definitely bumped down heparin binding by about twofold, which I think well, it's a little bit better local spreading. But the, um, the loop insertion is critical. And so one thing we're doing is alanine scanning on the loop insertion to figure out like what are the critical components. And the dream experiment is to do like an injection and cross-link and mass spec and figure out what the heck we're hitting. Because um, we don't understand how it's working right now. So it's a DT1, right? The insertion is a DT1? Yes. Yeah, a certain side of DT1. Um, so, um, oh, I should mention there's one pretty big caveat to AAV Retro right now, and this is not specific to it. It's every AAV serotype um, you know, uh, axon terminals and boutons have pretty different receptor and cell surface protein uh, composition. And particularly since we don't know what we're binding to, um, it doesn't work equally well for all fibers. Um, and so one that, you know, I may get some groans out of the audience when I tell you, it does not work well for aminergic projections. Um, we are trying to fix this. If you're lucky and your, for instance, dopaminergic projection goes from A to B and is not intermingled with non-dopaminergic projections that also go from A to B, then you can do a trick. And what you do is that at B, you infect it injects AAV retro CRE, and at the soma of A, you inject your CRE-dependent payload. 
And so back labeling is not zero, it's just low. But the magic thing about Cre is that you only need like 10 molecules of Cre and then you're in business in the soma. And so that seems to work pretty well. But I've talked to people and they're like, yeah, unfortunately I have this dopaminergic projection, but it's intermingled with all this other stuff. And if I try your trick, I'm just gonna label everything and it's gonna be deeply disappointing. But CAB2 yeah. works beautifully. Yeah, maybe okay, that, that you know, maybe we can look at that and and see if maybe we can like hybridize them and figure out, it'd, it'd be interesting to see, yeah, if we could figure out how CAB is doing that and if we can graph it. That's actually a really good point and I'm gonna write myself a note. Um, we're also just redoing the screening specifically on aminergic projections and hopefully something will just pop out even if we lack understanding as to how it's actually working. But um, for most, you know, I think almost all glutamatergic, GABAergic, cholinergic projections, this is pretty robust. So, for, yeah. Is, is one of the cores working with your teratype for DOT4 and for Oh, um, so, uh, yes. And we've um, uh, gone through a variety of people, and now AdGene is actually producing. Um, live viral preps, and it took us about nine months to help us debug that, uh, but they're working pretty robustly now. You can also uh, request them with standard payloads directly from us, um, and if we talk during the break, and there's just a website um, on Genelia where you just click and say, send it here, I want GFP, TV tomato, or Cree in there. And we're also putting, um, you know, more esoteric payloads like uh, what you need for TRAPC, uh, channelrodopsin, whatever. So yeah, this is this is building up fast. And for right now, I think either us or Adgene is going to be the place to, to get these um, these alloc ones. Um, just going to blow through, through super resolution imaging. Uh, one thing we've worked on is optimizing uh, photosensible floors for use in, uh, 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 you know, timestamp imaging and super resolution. Uh, one thing we did is we took EOS and by re-optimizing the uh, surface residues, we made it greatly more fixation resistant such that it can tolerate 4% PFA, 2% glute, 1% osmium tetroxide, and 1% uranyl acetate, all in resin. So this is a, and no other fluorescent protein survives this. So this is a pretty hardcore protein. And so you can do things um, like send it to the mitochondrion and um, unlike a lot of, of CLEM, uh, correlative light and electron microscopy, normally you do the CLEM first and then you do your EM preservation and then you do your EM, but you look and the two images look completely different because you've done dehydration, you know, like uh, post-staining, you've done all these horrible things to your tissue and it's like, wow, is that even the same cell? This is exactly the same uh, cover slip that's going into one into the fluorescence microscope and the EM. And so registration is pretty trivial. You just overlay them. And we, we try to put um, gold nanoparticles, which are both electron dense and fluorescence, to help with any warping that we need. Um, almost done. Uh, what's on the way? Uh, we now have EOS5 variants that survive osmium better. Uh, they're actually even a lot brighter, and I think they're gonna be better for um, filling you know, axons and dendrites if you wanna be able to trace them through um, serial uh, section EM. Uh, we're developing a second color 
for two color tall based on PSCSC2. Uh, instead of the irreversible switchers like EOS and PSCC2, um, we realized that Palm is not the only super resolution imaging modality of choice. And so we've uh, done the same thing for the reversible switchers like Skyland and Iris. Uh, we've made HRP tougher. So you can do, uh, you know, like DAV dependent electron uh, deposition in heavily fixed tissue. Uh, right now, this is in the fairly hydrophilic resin GMA. We're trying to get that to EPON, so you have the world's best quality EM. Um, and this is from like three days ago. Uh, we've made the first step. This is now a Drosophila brain after making a transgenic and letting it express and doing exactly, this is exactly the same 1% osmium, 1% urinal acetate, et cetera. And so now, in the near future, we hope, we hope to dive into these brains and, and um, reconstruct neurons, both in the, the light and electron channels. And this is actually my last slide. Um, so the last session we have coming up is on uh, cell type analysis. Um, this has been an, another awesome collaboration with uh, Alan um, and other people, but mainly the Alan, um, in that what we're looking at is um, projection-defined cell types and trying to dock that into the cell type atlas that um, Alan is busy achieving. Um, and so it's been, we're trying it by all fronts. So we're doing bulk RNA-seq on our back-labeled, these are the same back-labeled populations I showed you before from the pond and the colliculus and all that stuff. Um, Alan is doing single cell. Uh, there's a lot of uh, overlap between the bulk and the single cell, which is good, it means the whole thing's working. There's not complete overlap, which is also good because I think there are strengths and weaknesses of the two techniques. Um, and so they're very complementary, and we're now entering uh, a stage where we've got markers, and now we want to do RNA scope and antibody uh, labeling of these things to see if everything really makes sense and where these cell types are. Uh, if there's any sort of uh, uh, copy in there. Uh, it's been a great collaboration with the uh, Svoboda Lab, uh, particularly the Silka and Poop, and um, Alan's recent alum, Vilas, has been amazing at giving us uh, advice. And that's it. I guess I went over and I didn't really leave time for questions, but maybe we can. We, we can do, we could have a couple of questions. And okay. I'll be here. Great.
have some instantly recognizable, really cool topic patterns. Like sometimes they come back to, as layers, sometimes they come back to worlds. Um, and what we're doing is we're then um, dissecting out those things and then either doing hand sorting or fact sorting and sequencing those guys um, either with bulk or we FedEx those cells to Allen and they do single. And uh, it's been to try to pull out the markers for those projection classes. If, you know, what Carl wants is he just wants markers, he wants pre lines so that he can study just in like the thalamus projecting cells or in the pons projecting cells. But I think there's downstream going to be really cool uh, nuggets about cell type identity, like, you know, axon guidance factors and transcription factors to figure out, you know, like how those projection classes were established. And if we can then do, like, maybe knock those out, see if that messes up that projection. There have been a couple examples in that where people have. Um, identified interesting transcription factors and they got lucky. The first one they tried, they knocked it out and they managed to convert a neuron that projected to A to a neuron that projected to B. Um, so I think there's a lot of stuff that can be mined from this. I don't know if I answered your question. All Okay, uh, well maybe we better move on to the, the coffee break. Yeah, I know Lauren's going to be around for more questions. Thank you again.